allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please. Mr. Balfour. Here. Mrs. Bacco. Here. Mr. Bashada. Here. Mrs. Bruno Rafuya. Here. Mr. Syed. Here. Mrs. Esposito. Here. Mr. Lembo. Here. Mrs. Trapp. Here. And Mr. Mackey. Ladies and gentlemen, first we're going to start off the meeting. We have a presentation this evening. Uh, for those of you that may not know, April is um, School Library Month, and we have a proclamation, and then we're going to recognize our school librarians. I'll read the proclamation. Proclamation of Save Board of Education. Whereas the school library program, essential to the effective education for an information-based society, and whereas by supporting the goals of the Save Schools, and by serving all students and teachers, this program is an integral part of the instructional process, kindergarten through grade 12. And whereas the school library program offers an environment conducive to reading and learning, critical thinking, creative expression, investigation and research, professional growth, and curriculum development and enhancement. And whereas the school library program in Sable is enriched by its dedicated staff, volunteers, and many PTO gifts. Now therefore, I, Michael McInone, President of the Sable Board of Education, hereby proclaim that the District of Sable joins with districts across the nation in declaring April School Library Month, and do further proclaim that students and other citizens of the town of Sable are encouraged to visit the school libraries in each of our schools to partake of the special programs planned for the month-long celebration and to familiarize themselves with the services that are always available. So stated, this 12th day of April, 2011. At this time, we'd like to call up our library professionals. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
I, I would also like to uh, acknowledge Sandy Pearl, who works very closely with the, uh, the with all the ladies from the other Sandy, thank you very much. Sandy, thank you very much. Sandy, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, pressing on with the agenda, correspondence, everybody who sees uh, the monthly technology and maintenance workload reports, any questions? If not moving to the minutes, everybody should have received the minutes of the regular and executive meetings, both of March 15th. March 29th. Are there any questions, deletions, or additions to the minutes? If not, I'll take a motion to file and accept the minutes. So moved. Second. Need a roll call vote, please. Mr. Balfour? Yes. Mrs. Backo? Uh, yes, on the 15th, I'll stay on the 29th. She's not here. Yes. She didn't get <laughs> Mr. Bashada? Yes. Mr. Bruno Recuya? I have to abstain on the 15th, yes on the 29th. Mr. Sayek? Yes. Mrs. Esposito? Yes. Mr. Lumbo? Yes. Mrs. Stratt? Yes. And Mr. McNamara? Yes. Uh, next we have our student council representative, Mr. Terrence. During the school day today, student council uh, held uh, student council elections where uh, the students elected the new executive officers for the uh, SWMHS student council. And on April 27th, student council will be organizing an activities fair at the middle school to inform middle school students of the various clubs at the high school. Thank you, Mr. Next, we have our parent involvement representative report by Ms. Ben. On April 4th, the Parent Involvement Committee met, and our main topic was how we were going to get out the vote this year. We discussed were we going to sticker or not to sticker, and I believe the end result was we were going to use the stickers, and that was all we discussed that night. Okay, thank you. <coughs> we have no attorney's report. Uh, district highlights, Mr. Vice President. Yes. Jumping Jack Flash really raised some cash at the Eisenhower Elementary School. The Eisenhower students participated in their fourth annual Jumpathon for the American Heart Association. The students had great fun jumping rope, playing with the hula hoop, bouncing on exercise balls and stepping stairs, thereby learning the importance of staying active and physically fit. The students had collected pledges and raised over $6,500 this year, beating last year's total of $3,814. As a result of beating the previous dollar amount, Eisenhower's Nurse, Mrs. Edith Braun, and physical education teacher, Mr. Richard Tola, wore pink hair on a special celebratory day. This event not only taught the students the importance of staying healthy and keeping their hearts strong, but also about community service. Eisenhower Elementary School continues to show their generosity with the help of Mrs. Lauren Bellina, special education teacher, and Ms. Sophia Lopes, third grade student teacher. Together they organized a fundraiser for St. Jude's Children's Hospital. The fundraiser involved the students participating in a marathon and a penny war from March 14th through March 25th and raised $5,228 in just those two short weeks. This fundraiser developed into a wonderful learning experience with both staff and the students. Principal William Spronsky and his teachers showed great support and motivation within their classrooms, which resulted in a successful and rewarding experience. Due to the enthusiastic participation and contributions, Mrs. Mrs. Bellina and Miss Lopes will be rewarding all of the students by dressing up as the Mario and Luigi brothers. We are all very proud of the teamwork at the Eisenhower Elementary School and thankful for their help. Yet another fine example of children helping children. Congratulations to the Wilson School students and their parents for their participation in the Jump Rope for Heart campaign. Over $1,390 is raised for this worthy charity. Great thank you to Mr. Stephen Fisher who orchestrated the activity and today's program and activities. Wilson School, the small school with a big heart, continues to care. Congratulations to two members of the Samso Upper Elementary School Fifth Grade Chorus for being selected to the New Jersey Elementary Honor Chorus. Mayday, Mohammed Kandi, and Shelby, and Shelby Tarula were among just over 100 students selected from all across the state to participate in this elite ensemble. Along with Mrs. Amy Wells, choral teacher at Samsell, they will be attending a rehearsal this month and performing a concert of challenging choral repertoire in May. Magic is in the air, and we have the teachers who make it happen.
Congratulations to the following teachers who were honored by Magic 98.3 FM during their annual Teachers Who Make Magic contest. Of the 24 area teachers that were honored, three are, are, are from our town. Thank you to the following Cerebral District teachers who continue to make magic <coughs> in our schools. And they are Meredith Scully from Arleth, James O'Kelly from Eisenhower, and Mary Desmond from St. <laughs>
All right, then I have I have a couple other questions here. We have a, a check for the Caro Rubina, Rubino, uh, 11902 for 150, almost 155,000. Is that the final drawings for the solar system? No, Though that's the board, the board approved them to do the work on the uh, roofing project. That's all the roofing work that they've that's been working the roofing, on. That's the roofing, because prior to that we spent 39,000, almost 40,000. That's all their billing, that they, their progress billing on all the work they've been doing. Okay, and then I have one last question I have here. On our wireless for the month, uh, there's a $539.86. It's uh, uh, check number 119200. It came out of uh, 1100 triple zero 252. 600-91, which uh, it's a, a supply account. That's a supply account. You know, is that for one phone or is that for a group of services? I'm going to assume it's for several phones and several phones and uh, things that go with it, earpieces, batteries, and things of that nature. Yeah, because there's a whole bunch of items here uh, for accessories. There's, you know, I'm just Correct. wondering, you know, are we are we supplying the type of top of the line phone with internet? Uh, Depending on who's requesting it, some people are now getting the internet access and things of that nature for us to complete our jobs. Yes. Who are the people within the district that are supplying the cell phones right now? Besides, with cell phones? Yes. Every every maintenance person, almost every administrator. Are there different levels of cell phones provided to each one of these people? I'm going to say yes, right, Sandy? Different people have different types of cell phones. You know, custodians, I believe. I mean, the maintenance have just direct uh, Nextel systems, two-way two ra radios. A good number of the administrators uh, have email access and things of that nature. So everybody has different levels of uh, phone service. Thank you. Mr. Kinsai? Uh, two items. First, I need to abstain on a check for uh, with regard to the optimum light path, if I read this correctly, the 312,000 is for the core upgrades at the back end system. That's to bring this, to bring this in. To bring it in. The 37,000 is for the phone system, which phone. will allow us to get rid of the cabs yes, and well, go direct voice over IP. It's to, to give us a modified voice to voice over IP system, our, our internal phones are still going to be the phones we have. If you wanted to go to a full integrated voice over IP, you were probably looking at a cost of close to $700,000. This modification allows us to upgrade the, the backbone and not touch the phones. So it gives us a modified voice over IP system. Okay, and then the first proposal that's on there, which is the supply for the internet and the supply for the phone coming in, that's the one that's going to save us the $125,000 yes. a year. That's the one that's direct going to phone save and internet costs. Direct phone, internet access, and all those other things. And the best part is, is now you've expanded your pipeline. Um, By a thousand times, I believe? A thousand times, I mean, so, and the budget preparation was built on a one gig system. <coughs> uh, when we sat down with the committee, uh, we discussed as to why stay at a one gig, when 10 gig is the next level that's available and usable. So that's why these, these costs are slightly higher than what was in the original budget. But part of the $125,000 cost savings the first year going to have to be deferred to pay for these other items to upgrade uh, because the differential from the 1 gig to the 10 gig made the most sense because now instead of correctly saying the of a 3 to 5 year fix we're probably closer to a 10 to a 15 year fix now. Uh, we also explored the option of looking at buying and installing our own fiber network throughout the town. That was close to a million dollar cost. Uh, there were a lot of concerns that we had as far as maintenance, splicing, what happens if there's an accident, who repairs it, how long is it going to take. Uh, at $18,000, it made more sense to give that, work with someone, plus you get your E-rate funding, so on a yearly basis you can file for your E-rate, and you get discounts on that, and you get a refund from the uh, government on all these things, so it just made more sense to file in that manner and give us the bandwidth that we so desperately need keep our infrastructure moving forward and hopefully give the classrooms a lot better access to things that they're doing on a regular basis through technology. All right, the implementation time frame is through the summer and in September every goal is, is congratulating us on how fast the internet is. The goal is, is to hopefully have the internet and all up. 
the telephone system may be slightly behind that. There's more, a little bit more involved in the telephone system, but uh, the key is, is to start moving now, get these contracts rolling, uh, and spend the summer upgrading the core and getting everything moving forward for the opening of school. Okay. And that couples also with the generator we're doing. So all these things are going to upgrade. The, the generator is also part of upgrading the backbone. So it's guaranteed that we have simultaneous non, no disruption if anything occurs. So we're now going to have a backup generator also supplying everything. So uh, will there be bugs being worked out through the beginning of the school year? Absolutely. But uh, I feel we're moving in the right direction, uh, as I just mentioned to you earlier. After 10, it was Sandy 40 gig out there. Yeah. And somewhere down in Texas, Verizon is testing a 100 gig system. But I don't think we're ready for that. The 10, the 10 should carry us for a good, good amount of time. And trust me, all these acronyms they use is just driving me crazy on a regular basis. All right, and I also want to thank you because I know there was a, a communication gap with this, but when, yes. once it got to your desk, I'm happy we were able to move on and so we, we can uh, and take we'll advantage of it over the summer. Thank you. And I have to thank Carla, Sandy, and Michael Radowitz. We worked together. We, we went back and forth several times with the vendors, making sure that we were at as far as close to the cutting edge as we possibly could without going too far. And that's why really 10 gig really became the place to be. Uh, it seems that that'll give us the access we need for a good long time. Cost effective in the long run. That's and cost effective, yes. Mr. Beck. Number 13 and 14. Um, did we go out to bid on those projects? Uh, we got quotes on everything. And these are the, were they the lowest quote? Or Absolutely. We all go with the lowest quote. Okay. And I, um, I have to agree with I know that we've talked about doing this. Like this is a, a 60 month contract. What made like we only see this one light path? What was the other proposal and why was this one chosen and why were there only two? This was the cheapest. This was the cheaper one. Cheapest so and were, provided us the service that we required. So were the services identical? And we made that's what took the process so long, is that we made sure that each vendor provided us with identical proposals so there was no no discrepancy between their proposals. They were providing a 10 gig system, uh, 250,000 voice minutes or 2,500 for the voice. I forget what number it's. 100, sorry. One was at 100, one was at 200. So we made sure that everybody was providing what was required to go forward. And, and this who was, was the other proposal from? Um, IP net, zone. IP net zone, Verizon, but Verizon never came back never with anything. <laughs> and they were both the ones that were out on the uh, 470 application that's been out on the uh, federal website. Okay, and for 19 and 20, did you look for um, these items outside the realm of state contract or did you only look in state contract? Basically, these are the state contract to people and we found over the years their pricing has always been the best out there. Uh, they're reliable companies and they do a, a lot of work with us already. Moving to section C, personnel non certified on page seven, custodial transfer, a medical leave, uh, some professional days. Uh, there's a few job coach uh, resolutions, four and five. Number six is the appointment of a, a maintenance worker and a custodian, as well as number seven, some substitute hires. Um, any questions with section C? With not moving to D, personnel certified, um, we have a resignation. Uh, Tara, who is on, uh, I believe she was on maternity, um, she's staying home to raise her family. Two, retirement, uh, William Skaronsky, Jeanette Moser and Kathleen Zenny and Joel Burkham. Um, I want to wish each and every one of these well, these individuals well. Um, I did work with uh, Mr. Skoransky, obviously. Ms. Zenny was my fifth grade teacher when I was in the middle school, and she was uh, a very, very good uh, fifth grade teacher. I'm going to miss her. And Joel Burkham has been in the district for over 40 years. So, um, and Ms. Moser has been in the district for a very long time. So I want to congratulate these people and um, wish them very well. Number four is an unpaid medical leave. Number five is a pregnancy leave. Six is a 
pregnancy leave. Um, number seven is child rearing leave for a few individuals. Unpaid personal leave, pregnancy leaves are nine and ten. Uh, and some contractual retirement payouts and a, a, a submittal of the professional development plan for the Sayreville School District to the county office. This is a really difficult report to complete. I want to congratulate and thank Ms. Sutherland as well as the professional uh, development committee. It's not an easy job to put this together and we're hoping that uh, the professional development board approves it in a timely fashion. Um, moving to number 14 on page 11. These are professional days for the month. Uh, any questions with section B? We're not moving to E policy, no report. Moving to page 13, second reading of the 2011-2012 calendar on the curriculum, section F. Moving to page 14. Can you just, uh, while you're on the schedule of uh, the calendar, just talk about the changes you made um, to um, take care of the concerns that were presented to the board on the Sure. Um, basically, we're doing the same thing we've done in the past. However, we're being a little bit more diligent in explaining what will happen if we get um, a rash of snow days next year or in for inclement weather. And if you look at the first paragraph, it says very clearly now, if schools are closed for any reason, then some of the days may be made up at the end of the school year or January 16, 20th, April 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th. So we will start again as we did this year from the end of the calendar and if we get an exorbitant amount of days then we'll start taking them off of the holidays within the calendar itself. And I find it to be a lot more efficient and effective because there's a lot of school districts this year that really had to pile up and lose a lot of days in the interior parts of their calendar because they went over their snow days and subsequently it, it became a problem for them. Number two on page 14 is what we've been waiting for. Promotion ceremony at the middle school is the 22nd of June, which is a Wednesday. High school graduation is June 23rd. Last day for students is the 23rd. And the last day for teachers is on Friday the 24th. Uh, the extended school year program is once again from July 5th to August 12th. Special services placements and the alike are on page 17. Um, are there any questions with that section? Good question. On number two, how many days does that make in attendance? Is that the 180? 182, 186. 182. It's, it's similar to what we've done always in the past. Um, moving to section G. Will we hosting a summer enrichment program again this year? Yes. 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 Section G, co curriculum. These are some uh, drama show at the. Um, uh, approval at, at the Allman School as well as the chorus concert. Number two is the end of the year party for the Truman Elementary School and number three is meet the characters of Oklahoma Pancake Breakfast um, at the middle school uh, on May 1st in the high school cafeteria. Any questions with G? With non-moving to age support services, the waiver of transportation policy. Uh, these are number two is a bunch of transportation contracts. Number three are seven different trips uh, for approval. Uh, moving to the addendum in the front of your packet. Um, in section um, on the presentation, we had a proclamation, which we discussed in the beginning, congratulating the, uh, the month as being the um, Libraries Month of, of April. Uh, section C, there is an addition, number eight. Please add the following resolution. The Board of Education is requested to approve a five-day suspension without pay for custodians Joseph Barney and Thomas Siegel on dates determined to be appropriate by the superintendent of schools. Uh, section D, um, please add the uh, following uh, individuals for their payouts for retirement. Number 15, and I would like to uh, make sure everybody sees this on the addendum, page two, um, is the Board of Education. These are our next year's Teachers of the Year Middlesex County Governor's Teachers Recognition. And they are Kelly Whiteley from Arliss Elementary School, 
Lori McLaughlin from Eisenhower School, Lisa Seiko from Truman School, Adrian Vissong, West Wilson School, Mary Desmond from Samso Upper Elementary School, Tara Cleary from the Middle School, and Keith Mahoney from the High School. Number 17 is a few additional substitutes added to the list. Co curricular with G, um, it's a Wilson Elementary School, we'll hold a call rush on the 30th, and finally, um, a high school uh, class trip, uh, an additional class trip. That concludes my report, Mr. President. Hey, before I open up the public, any questions from the board on the agenda, Mr. Packer? Um, can you just explain on that number 16 why? One is a non-tenure, the bottom one, and then the top one is tenure. What's the difference between the two? The tracks. The tracks, like Nicole Gross is under tenure. Well, and then first off, the, anything that's a $200 per day is not on the right, tenure track. the first one and the last one. Replacement. They're replacement teachers. If you're under replacement, you're a non-track uh, tenured person. So if you're a replacement, if you're replacing somebody, you can't go on the uh, tenure track. Okay, but the temporary replacement one, why is that one tenured? The first one is tenured? And that's a replacement? What's the distinction? Nicole Gross is a tenured teacher who is returning from maternity leave, but she's filling in for Kristen Hayes at the high school who's going out on maternity leave. And we're keeping Scott Fossiello, the bottom one, in Nicole's spot at Eisenhower, where he has been since the beginning of the year. Yeah, we're just moving people around. Thank you, Marilyn. That was a good explanation. Good. <laughs> Any other questions for the board before I open up the phone? Seeing none at this time, I'd open up the public. For any questions or comments on the agenda items only, please be mindful that we'll open up the public again. For any remaining business, may come before the board. So please come up and state your name and record um, and address uh, Mrs. Kilcom. It's very nice to see you. <laughs> <laughs> Barbara Kilcom, you sound like Mayor O'Brien. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think you just insulted me and complimented me. Oh, I insulted you? Yeah. Thank you. 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 Oh, I insult you? No, I won't repeat that. It's on camera. But I'm staying here. Everybody just trusts you implicitly that nobody questions this, but I mean, it's my tax dollars, and I'm just wondering if, if these board members don't see it, and they don't know, and you just say you take the lowest bid. The council runs a little bit differently, and I believe they're privy to the bids, the vendors, and everything else. Here, it's just like the proposals. You say, I received two other proposals. This was the lowest, and that's it. Well, see, we're, we're allowed to ask. Sure. Um, th this is this is this issue that we were talking about um, is something we've been talking about for, for quite some time of upgrading this building. Um, again, a building built in the seventies. Nobody was thinking about fiber optics and, and all kinds of uh, so technology. So this is the computer portion. Right. Of it. Right. This is our yeah, which is tied into our phone and, and our technology. Um, we could we get this. In, this is not the first time we see this tonight. We've had this for several days. And anybody knows if you have any questions, everything's on file with the business administrator's office to see if you want to see. Now, this particular thing we're familiar with, um, because the state contracts are the lowest, and that's what we should be doing as, as municipalities, as school districts, to be using the state contracts because those are the lowest, lowest bids. So this is not something that just we the board was informed today. Matter of fact, Mr. Bashad was, you know, was very involved with this because he was concerned with the cost that we were using for cell, you know, cell phone services and all these types of things. And Mr. Syak, who's an electrical engineer, I rely heavily on his ability to tell us what technology is suitable for what we need. So this is not something that is it, just been discussed today. This has been something that's been ongoing for, I'd right, say, probably since so the it's summer. So not, it's not bids, it's just proposals. And, right. and, it, and it was part of our budget process. Right. Yeah. It was in the budget as well. And that's what it's 
Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else uh, from the public would like to come up and ask any questions about the agenda? If not, I'll close this public portion and I'll entertain a motion to finally accept the superintendent's agenda. So moved. I need a second. Second. Now I need a roll call. Mr. Balfour. I need to abstain on B8. Yes, no, all right. Mrs. Baxter. Yes. Mr. Bashada. Yes, and I just a note that I'm happy that with Life Path that we will be saving the district a substantial amount of money because over the period of the last four or five months, I've been keeping numbers here anywhere between thirty and thirty-five thousand dollars a month <coughs> for Verizon, and it's one of the issues that I, we're going to finally start saving some money. Mrs. Bruno Vicuia. Yes. Mr. Sire. Yes. Mrs. Esposito. Yes. Mr. Lemba? Yes. Mrs. Trapp? Yes. And Mr. McNamara? Yes, so we have a little background information and discussion. At this time, um, the delegate from New Jersey School Board Association, Mr. Sayak, I just want to mention Mr. Sayak uh, called me today as he was sitting in an airport in um, San Francisco and was flying back where he was elected to the, the uh, National School Board Association. So, um, congratulations. <laughs> is going to explain to me exactly how that's going to benefit us here. So, uh, <laughs> I don't get paid anything but, uh, to answer that question. Well, Mr. Sayak, um, what's going on on uh, the New Jersey School Board front? Actually, I just want to talk for a minute about the, uh, the conference and also issue uh, some thank yous. Um, as Mr. Mackinac mentioned, I did go out to uh, San Francisco. I was elected to the Board of Directors for National School Boards. Uh, and I tell you, one of the, uh, first of all, the makeup of the board of directors, it's interesting because I've been on the board here 17 years and I'm a senior member and now as a member of the board of directors which is composed of all school board members from across the country, I'm actually one of the more junior members. The uh, average range of service is about 25 to 27 <coughs> years of service on your local board uh, for these people that are serving on the uh, board of directors, so it's a tremendous group. Uh, but one of the things that really got me excited, uh, and, and I really you know, appreciate it, is when they called me out on stage in front of all the, uh, the board members there at the conference to introduce the new board of directors. Uh, they introduced me, and they didn't say I was from the Northeast region, they didn't say I was from New Jersey, they said I was from Sarahville, New Jersey. And I was really happy that Sarahville was getting recognition as a community that supports not only education, but also supports public education. And I really want to thank this community because if I wasn't here, I couldn't be there. I want to thank the board that I serve with. Uh, and I also want to really thank the people who I learned from. Uh, people who a lot of you out there in the audience may not remember or may not know, but people like Elaine Kubats, people like Barbara Anderson, Danny DiPaolo, Harry Pachikowski. These were people that were on the school board back in the 1990s when I first got elected. And I had the privilege of learning from them and being mentored by them, and it's helped me tremendously to be able to continue to serve for the last 17 years, as well as take a role at the national level. So I wanted to use my report just to say thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sack. Under discussion, um, just one thing I, I just want to put the public that I'm, um, I'm very happy to announce that the Sable Board of Education uh, has reached a memorandum of agreement with the Sable Education Association at about 10.32 p.m. last evening. <coughs> Um, and I, I just want to compliment, uh, this uh, was, um, this materialized, this actually happened, I want to say, due to the leadership, uh, the tenacity and the professionalism of um, Krista Blushin, and I want to thank her and the members of the bargaining committee. screening for athletes who, who owns that. I would like to once more again offer to parents in the district uh, private cardiac screening. We tried to run this in the fall, but we didn't have enough participants. Uh, we're hoping that uh, with enough advertisement, we'll get more participants. Again, this is not sponsored by the Board of Education, but we are going to need the assistance if we do this of the um, athletic trainer to process the paperwork for the cardiac screenings. I did it for H1N1, but, uh, and I went to the training with all the nurses, but I, I'm not up to speed on my uh, cardiac e, uh, EEG and EKG testing. So uh, the total maximum cost for his time, that would be 
would include being here doing the, um, with the people that come in to do the, the testing, as well as processing all the paperwork, would be approximately 30 to 40 hours uh, at using his summer trainer rate, it would be about $1,680 max for us to run this program. Is there a cost to the system, I think? Yes, it's, it, I think it's $70. Which is cheaper than if you went to a uh, Certainly. Okay. And who is it open to? It open to all student athletes. We're, we're starting it small at this particular point in time. We want to keep it to student athletes at this time to see if we can generate enough. We'll just have to send you to a workshop for them. I, I couldn't fit it in my schedule. Krista kept me busy with negotiations. So we're going to be asking the board then to approve? I'm asking for direction. We would like to offer the program, uh, and I'm also asking for permission to use Mr. Waits to coordinate the program. Uh, for the students in school. So Mr. Bishad, are you saying you I, I would highly recommend it, you know, because our students' health is, you know, on the field, we're responsible, and I, I think it's a good idea for all our student athletes to know whether there is a, a hidden issue. And, and I know, Mr. Cooley, you're the one who actually brought this up. Uh, started to the board. You're the one who initiated this, so now this is just something that we're going to do. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Let's settle down here. Mr. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I'm in support of it. I would like to open it up to more so we can you know, revisit that. I, I, I can look into it. Okay. How many did you have last time? Oh, JK isn't here, I don't think. I think we had, we needed 25. We didn't we have 25. We need but we had some. Yes. Over. The, way, the way it works is if a student's on free or reduced lunch, they get the testing for free. So the agreement that we have with the private provider is that we have to have 25 paid. Um, athletes. We, we had more than enough students who are creating reduced lunch looking for a free screening, but we didn't have the 25 paid. Uh, but I, again, it, it got a lot more conversation. Uh, I, I think there's a possibility we'll get the number that we need. Was that, the matter, was that a matter of getting the word out? I'm sure the coaches know about it and we have some type of... Yes, but sometimes you have to wait until something passes you by before you really pay attention that you missed something. I, I think we're at that level. Okay. Can, can we build it into, uh, not the screening, but can we build the marketing into our high school orientation program as a component? Because I think the, that a notice going home doesn't necessarily drive into action. Yeah. Well, the we, put it, we did put it on the, on the website. It was on the website. I think right now, it, with your approval, we're scheduling it for May 21st. Again, if we have enough people. If we don't have enough people, we might push it till, you know a little later in the season to see if... Uh, see if we can get enough individuals to participate. Can you use the phone system to target the student athletes? Like we, we did. You did. Oh, yeah, we did. did. Oh, it's yeah, okay. we did. So we will again? Yes, we will. Okay. I feel I'm in support of that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. All right, so um, I'll okay. open up for the public and hear comments and we'll give you the direction. Thank you. So it seems like the board's a good set. Um, lastly, Dr. O'Connor, you have the reorganization meeting down here for May 3rd. Yes, and it's also a special meeting we talked about um, yeah. on May 10th. There's going to be a special meeting of the um, State Board of Education. May. Just make sure we notify that. 6 p.m. and post it. You yeah. want to do 6 p.m. right as that You know we're going to do 6 p.m. <laughs> All right, 6 p.m. And then post it. May 3rd, we agree organization at 7.30 start? Yeah, 7.30. Uh, that's the regular board meeting. And then the May 10th one will start at 6 p.m. Can we have um, at the reorg, do you guys want a uh, closed session? Not really. Not. That's okay with me. Okay, no, it's, it's an action meeting. It's an action meeting. It's always an action meeting. Yeah, it's an action meeting. Okay. The board is convened, yes. And so will a uh, special meeting be there. Yeah. If there's no other discussion uh, from the board, I like, have, yes. I have four things I'd like to discuss. Okay, give us two. Well, I'm going to give you all four, whether you like it or not. The first, the first item, it, I, I've been talking to some parents. Uh, I had the opportunity, I've been going to the home baseball games here. It was brought to my attention. And it's been going on for a while that our, our baseball and our softball teams, actually those students can't participate in the senior trip, which I think is unfair. Uh, you know, they're seniors because they play baseball, and the way the scheduling of the trip is, you know, the trip can be changed. 
I think all of our students should have the opportunity of going on the senior class trip. Now, I've seen emails shot back and forth that have been sent to me that you have a choice, either play <coughs> baseball or don't go on a trip. I don't think that's fair because the basketball team can go, the, the football team can go, uh, the soccer teams can go. I mean, it should be, the senior trip should be open to everyone. And that's my feeling. <coughs> I believe there's a bunch of people feel the same way about this. Well, uh, this, is, this comes up every year. Uh, every year it comes up because of, now I know when we investigated in one year, um, we looked at why is that this particular day. And I think the day has to, uh, is coordinated by where they're going when they have that senior night type of thing. Um, also, I know they have to avoid um, AP exam is another thing that you have to work around as well. Now, I have mixed feelings on this. Um, I understand um, that if a student is, is an athlete for four years playing baseball and softball, a decision is made. Um, I'm going to see the trip or am I going to play ball? Um, I don't like that situation the student is in either, but obviously we're not going to change the baseball or softball season because that's our rock for sure. Secondly, I understand from the coach's perspective, saying, hey, I'm feeling the team, I'm fielding a team to win, um, and if you're going to be committed to the team, you're committed to the team. I don't have a solution for this. You know, as a parent, if my kid was involved, I'd say life is about making choices. Um, I don't want to deny a kid going on a senior trip, but you know, I mean, what do we do? Um, Scheduling. Oh, that's that's has to be from high school. That has to be the high school administration to make that call. And, that's, and I think that there were there's a few dates, a few a few Disney dates that are available. But like Mike said, the AP exams conflicted with one of them. Right. And. Unfortunately, there's always going to be a conflict, whether it's SATs or AP or, or baseball, uh, or even in the winter basketball. What would you so suggest, Mr. Pichon? I would suggest that we look at a scheduling change here that our student, the people that want to participate in softball, or even track, I think track may be involved in this also. That there's, a, there's a team yeah. every just, day. Just so the board understands the implication, the trip is built around the grad night program which has, I think it's 100,000 high school seniors from across the country, it's only offered three nights a year. And none of those dates are prior to the start of baseball season. Um, so if you were to do that, you would benefit these kids that are involved in baseball, but you would deprive all the other students of the opportunity to participate in the grad night program. Now sometimes I think it's unavoidable. I, mean, I think this year, I think there was a modification made because of AP exams and other times where we, we're not doing the grad night. But just so the board understands the implications, if you start rescheduling, you're going to change the integrity of the things that happened with the trip. Well, let's let's get some input. Well, you know, we can get input from administration, something to look at, and get some input from the parents also. I think, you know, because, you know, we can't do nothing about this year because the senior trip is already scheduled, but next year and the years after, it's something that we can look into. Let me go on to item number two. Uh, the baseball field. Have, has anybody looked at our baseball fields around here besides the students that play? I mean, they look like sand lots. This, this field out here that we play our varsity baseball ball looks like a sand lot. We had the opportunity Saturday, there was three of us from the board, went to the Serval Little League for their opening day and their fields look what they should look like. This looks like masonry sand out here. And also yesterday, one of the students had a ball hit because of the way that the field is, got hit in the mouth. Luckily, didn't have any teeth knocked out. I mean, we've got to start looking at, we spent a million two or plus to do a football field, which is an all-purpose field. And yet, where the J JVs play and our girls softball team play, and where our varsity foot uh, baseball team plays, I mean, you know, well, I, I feel embarrassed as a board member when teams come from out of town. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Just to comment on the softball field, and I don't know if Chris was here. I believe those fields have to be clay infield. I don't believe they're grass. And that's why the two fields over here are all dirt. I think that's the requirement of the softball. Well, the other day they had the softball playing on the far end and the JVs were playing out yes, here. Yes, but I Marshall think that Road. those fields specifically have to be without a grass infield, if I'm correct. I, I don't know. I know JK's not here, if there's someone else. But I, I, I believe those fields are specifically built that way. Without the grass in the field. Let me, let me address, your, address your comments. Yes. Okay, this is something that I owned a couple of years ago. We were concerned about the condition of the field. Matter of fact, Dr. O'Connor and I, while waiting for the farm bus to leave, walked on the field and the coach was there. Since then, we had a contract in the spring, um, and we still have that contract under the county and get the fields ready for the sport. 
Also, we, 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 we purchase defenses that were lacking, so we have some boundaries in which we're going to be score. Um, and it's always been this policy. And this very board, and a lot of us that were on this board right now, had said this when we put that <coughs> football field in, we talked about the equity. To say, look, we're providing a top-notch field for football, we should not neglect the other, other, other sports. And we all understood that. Okay? I know one of my daughters played football, so I was very interested in, in making sure there was equity in all the fields. Um, I'm assuming we still, because I saw the contract was out there in the spring. They, they were here and did their work. And there's a continuing maintenance on the fields that we have to do. So I, I don't know, where, where is the, you're the chairman of the Buildings and Grounds Committee. Well, that's so where's I mean. the disconnect? I'll tell you what, if you go out there and you look at the in the ruts that are in the field, instead of the, it looks like sugar sand. You know what sugar sand is? Masonry white sand. Yeah, what do we need to do? That's what I'm trying to do. What we have to do is we have to, on the infield area, we have to add some type of material, a different sand to make it playable, that it doesn't deter it. it the texture of the sand, it's got to be changed. That's what I'm saying. And, and we, Again, we hired the contractors. And they are paid thirty they're professional they're professional people who do fields yeah. for us. Uh, okay, they're the ones that brought in the, the clay mixture and everything else. So but my assumption is it's being done according to the NJSIAA rules and regulations because if it wasn't, I'm sure you would have had coaches from other teams and people of that nature complaining about does, the conditions about the It doesn't look like a baseball field should look like. If you were to go like the, the color of the sand or whatever it is, I don't know if it's clay. And, and you're talking about maintenance on it. I know when I was there Wednesday, no, Monday when I was there, that infield wasn't watered prior to the game, which made the field a uh, a hazard to be point blank. We don't have to worry about that. I couldn't answer that. I don't. I don't know the proper maintenance of a field. Well, I think it's clearly Dr. O'Connor that we can have the athletic director who can condition the field and check the fields are ready to play. I spoke to JK today and. Um, we did spend uh, quite a bit of money to well, so uh, rent, rent the, 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 or whatever it is, yeah. the four or five fields that we have. Um, I coached 15 years baseball. The biggest difficult thing that you have is when you don't have a skin in field and you don't have constant maintenance. Remember, when you see these manicured fields that look perfect, you have 15, 10 people working on them every single day. We have, what, three maintenance guys that are doing every single piece around this entire campus, which is huge. When you don't have a skin infield, the big, most difficult thing is, is to keep the grass in the infield and keep that infield so that it doesn't turn into a rock or, like Tom was saying, turns into a sand pit. There's a, there's a mixture that you, you, that you really need to know what you're doing to keep that. That's why we paid. And I was out on the field the other day, but it was raining, so I couldn't really tell whether or not, you know, the field was hard. We have a water cannon out there, okay, and they're supposed to be watering the field occasionally as the field starts to get extremely hard. We don't have great drainage out there, nor does any high school field really, probably, in, you know, any high school environment because we, they weren't really made for that. So there is always problems with drainage. I spoke to JK this afternoon. He and I are going to go out on the field. We're going to take a look at it. Maintenance guy is going to get out there. They, they know how much of a mixture there should be with clay and sand. And you have to be very careful. You can't make the infill too clay, and you can't make the infill too sandy. Because what will happen is exactly what you're saying. You're either going to play in quicksand, or you're going to play in a sand pit. Okay. Well, so, let's just we, we, you know, that's why i got to go to JK and he's got to take a look at it. I'm going to speak to speak for the board, and I think I disagree. It's just, the board's concern is that we have an infield, the baseball field, in the best shape we can get it in for the sport we play. I think that's, a, that's reasonable. Two quick things. Pets on the field. I called the Mayo uh, last week. There was uh, people that have brought their dogs and walked all around the property with a dog. Uh, we have a, Mrs. Trapp was one of the ones that were in, well, had, signs, had signs, had signs, but no pets allowed on school property. No, Mrs. Jill, Mrs. Trapp was a walking dog. Okay. <laughs> but anyhow, the issue is that, you know, we have to notify or put more signs up. Uh, I don't want to have to call.
a police officer to come in because somebody's got a dog <coughs> and take the dog off school property. And it's been an issue. I think what we need to do is make sure that our, our employees that are out there, that, that that's police. Okay, the last, this is the last item, I promise you. Fine. Trainer's room. All right. Uh, what happened is when they did the trainer's room, they put four windows in and they all open in. Two of the windows on each end cannot be opened. And with summer coming, with with the football camps and with uh, you know Hell Week, whatever you want to call it, when the trainer is going to administer whatever has to be done to the athletes, it's going to be 120 degrees in there. Could we please put an air conditioning unit in that office for him to work with? I think we could. I guess that's requested, and then that's yeah, I, I'd, I'd like, like to, I'd like to have to You know, it's it's you know, and how that's do you have room? No, maybe they could reverse the windows also that they go right. out instead of coming in. I don't know. That's part of the new construction. No, that's no. the old the old gym. Okay, the old gym. Okay. All right, that's it. Any, okay, any other board members discussion before I open up for the public? Seeing none? I have. This is back though. Um, I just have two things. One, since we're talking about sports, um, at the swim banquet there was um, a board put up with students' times and records that was presented by the parents. And the swim team had wanted it to be hung by the pool, but it was denied. Um, I'd like to see that we could make some mechanism to hang it here somewhere in the building and we can get it made Close to the to cover. The The other topic, which is more complicated and something that I've talked about three times at least, but we're going to try once again, is the Citizens Campaign and Common Cause and going out for RFPs for brokers to try to save money. If any of you follow it, it was in the newspaper again now. Perth Amboy followed Cherry Hill, and Perth Amboy now followed that model for the resolution um, for RFPs for brokers, and they're looking at anticipated savings of $3 million with no change in insurance coverage. Um, the last time I brought it up, I was asked to submit the information to all the board members, which I did. So hopefully everybody's read it, and I'd like to take a poll to see if the board is willing to go out and model, um, approve this model from Common Cause and put this resolution up. Well, just I so I understand, oh, I'm sorry, but just so I understand this, they went, for example, in Cherry Hill, they went out for RFPs for health benefits consultants, not Correct. brokers, because we've got a broker now, right? Because yeah, that's the, there's a difference between a broker and a consultant. The broker gets a commission off the insurance premiums. The consultant is paid a flat fee by the school board. We used to have a consultant. We changed over to a broker. So you're suggesting that we go back now to a consultant. I'm suggesting that we put in a process where we put in an RFP process and we follow this model and what this model calls for. And you were at the same seminar that I was, Kevin, so right. um, you understand that um, what they want you to do is go out for competitive pricing and their model actually includes like three different categories and they want you to go right. ask But just so the board's clear, we do do that. We do go out on a yearly basis and we've gotten proposals for our consultants. The only thing we have not done is ask for a flat fee. Okay, um, that's so if the only we do difference. do it, there shouldn't be a problem adopting the resolution. If well, the, first thing, the resolution that you forwarded is a resolution for municipalities, so you couldn't use no. that resolution. No, it's for the school district. No, the citation they use is the municipal code, so it would have to be modified, which our attorneys have done for us. Uh, so I have the modified code. Our attorneys have some concern about the wording as to the restrictions that it applies uh, to the wording that they're using. Uh, but currently, we already go out for proposals. Uh, the last time we did it, we had four different proposals, if I remember correctly, four proposals come in. We've never done a flat fee proposal. Uh, some of the concerns with the Cherry Hill and the other ones is that most of their cost savings came from going over to the state health benefits which your current contract language uh, does not allow you to do because it's not an equal to or better program than what you currently offer. And that would have to be through the negotiations process to go to the state health benefits. Uh, the only thing that we do not do uh, that that citizens campaign has recommended is to use a flat fee or request a flat fee pricing from your brokers. And, um, and I 
I don't favor that process uh, because I believe you'll get what you pay for and you may not get the process that you offer. And, and to defend our current brokers, um, if it's a matter of fee base, you're coming off three out of four years where he, they've actually negotiated 0% increases on your premium. So uh, if it's a concern as to level of service uh, and their commission being paid, they, they do the job to protect the district. Who's he um, paid by? They're paid directly by the carriers. But we don't know what we pay. Right, so we don't no, know. No, we get a statement. I get the you statement in your proposal that indicates <coughs> the amount of money that they're paid. Their fee bases are in their proposals that they submit uh, from the carriers. And this year, currently, uh, Doyle Alliance has issued a new letter uh, reducing their fee structure to two point, uh, the letter reads, if I remember the letter correctly, 2.8% uh, is what they reduced their premium structures down to. Uh, on their uh, contributions uh, that the carriers are working with. Uh, there are different ways, different models you can use uh, to work through it. Um, the citizens campaign people are, are promoting certain things. Um, Perth Amboy became uh, a district of interest for them because of the problems they've had with all of their insurance and things of that nature. But that was on the municipal side. Municipal side and I believe the paper read school side, well, but I'm not aware of it. The current article in the paper talked about Citizens Campaign that briefed the Perth Amboy Board of Education yes. because of what happened with the Perth Amboy municipality. The superintendent and the school board president, as well as the DA, were quoted in that article saying that the board didn't have any problem with it because everything that they were saying, they were already doing. And we do the same, same thing here. Here. So that's what I didn't <laughs> To me, when we do our brokerage, I equate it to, believe me, I, I don't have a lot of knowledge about this. It's like if I want to buy a house, I go to a real estate broker. I'm not paying that broker. That broker is going to find me a house. I'm going to tell them what I want and what price range. And if they sell me that house, they will get a commission from the person selling the house. And that's similar to what's going on with the health care. So I don't care what that person is paying them because I'm looking to pay in a certain price. That's going to come out of their profit, not mine. And that's what we do. That's currently what we, what we do. Yes. Do. That's why I didn't understand what else we could do. You can go to a flat fee. Uh, right now, the only district that I know in our area that has flat fee is Edison, and I've had a conversation uh, with the BA there uh, that, believe it or not, stems back to a letter back in 1988 that Grinspec issued that was the same concern from uh, past board members, uh, where Grinspec issued a letter stating, don't reduce the premiums, you're hurting my commissions, and that's how far back they went, but uh, I feel comfortable in knowing that uh, any broker that I've ever worked with has always worked for the best interest of the districts. And I truly believe that in Doyle Alliance because you're coming off three or four years where your insurance premiums have been negotiated down to a zero. And, and we're doing very well this year with their support and their help behind the scenes negotiating uh, with health benefits as we continue to uh, do it forward. Uh, again, to reiterate what you said, we follow everything they currently do except for one part. What is the advantage of that, or is there any? Uh, the only advantage is, is that you you get a flat fee and you hope that all your services that you're being provided are equal to them what, you're, what you're currently getting, and that at some point in time they don't say, well, you know what, I've exhausted all of my fee, here's your renewables, thank you, and here are your, here are your numbers. Well, if I get a flat fee, then what would incentivize me to work with different companies to get you the best price? I'm going to get the same dollars if I do nothing. Uh, again, that's, that would be my only concern, and it would be the integrity of the company you select. Uh, again, you'll, you can go for RFPs. Uh, you may select the cheapest, but that's exactly what you may get, the cheapest product also, or the cheapest service. You may get someone that does not have a number of municipalities, uh, a large number of them, the ability to negotiate with the carriers based on their book of business to help the overall package. Um, I've read the citizens' campaign. I, I understand what they're trying to push for. Uh, it, myself and Mr. Mm -hmm. uh, Derek Jess, we did bring it back to our county association members so that they are aware of it. We felt strong enough that our members know that this, these, this group is out there. Uh, so we're paying attention, and uh, I feel confident in that we're abiding by all the rules and regulations that are put upon us by the state for public bidding and bylaws um, that we abide by every aspect of it. Uh, 
Uh, they, they have some valid recommendations. Uh, unfortunately, some of those are restricted by contract language that you're unable to reap the benefits of a $3 million savings, so-called, that Cherry Hill and other districts receive. It was not strictly by changing their broker that they saved $3 million. There are other issues incorporated into that. You said the state health plan was one of them. State health plan, my understanding is the state health benefit plan was one big, major part of that. I have a question. Can the insurance companies give us quotes with that commission taken out of it so that we can compare it? Absolutely. I mean, when the broker proposes his renewals, in his proposals, he indicates his percentage numbers. So you can just work out, the math can be easily worked out in it. Uh, the thing is, those numbers translate to a flat fee. We can do it either way. Well, then we can compare it to see if we go to a flat fee, if it would be beneficial. Uh, again, but your con the concern I have is that your flat fee, will your services be equal to what you're currently getting? That's my only concern. And that's my concern every time that the board discusses any type of professional service, is I tend not to look at, please don't look at how much are they gonna charge you for that service. You need to focus on, are those services gonna meet the needs and the requirements of the school district? They're professionals, they work in that manner. Just because they're the lowest does not make them the best, and they're not gonna work in the best interest of the district. Um, we work with great companies, Brown & Brown, Grinspec, Doyle Lines, they've all done that for us in our renewals on a yearly basis. So uh, that's my only concern is that you go out for an RFP, you have to make sure you structure it in a way that you're not just getting the mom and pop store on the corner that knows how to buy insurance and they come in with a low price and then you look at it and say, wow, look at this price, this is what they can do for us. But are they gonna provide you with the continuity for insurance claims when people have high risk claims that they can't get resolved? Are they going to step in and be a third party <coughs> negotiator to get those claims uh, resolved for you? Are they going to be there at the negotiation sessions providing you with the expertise and the knowledge to know where your dollar savings are? Are they going to be there to service the client? Uh, I do know from working, speaking to one DA, uh, that they tend to stay away from claims from the carriers or from the employees. They now want you to hire someone to be that intimate, intermediary person to take their claims, see what their problems are, and then deal with the insurance company. So you have to structure it in a very definite, finite way to make sure that all of the services that you're getting today are in your RFP and that their services will be provided in a similar manner moving forward. Uh, I do know Edison, that was one of the things he indicated that he had to go back and hire a, a benefits person in district to deal with the, the middle part when people have concerns with their health benefits and can't get the claims resolved. Right now, we just turn that over to our current broker and they take it and run it. We don't have anyone that has to sit and go back and forth with that. Thank you. President of the Middlesex County School Board Association, this was brought in to that meeting with the delegates from out the, throughout the county. Yes, it was. The purpose of this was what, to show a better way of financing health care benefits or what? It, it was to show an alternative in terms of a way that you could possibly save money. Now right. the question is whether or not you actually will. And, and actually, now this is uh, Bruno Lacuna's idea about separating out the commission. I think that would work the first year. But then the question is, when you go back into your renewal cycle, are they going to simply continue to not charge you the commission? Or if there's $100,000 of commission they could get, are they going to still charge you $70,000 but not tell you it's commission? Granted, that money won't go to the broker, but it would go directly to the insurance company. To use the real estate analogy, because the one that Mr. Magno brought up is a good one, if my aunt is a real estate agent for me and I'm selling my house to Mr. McIntyre, I'm not going to tell him that my aunt is the real estate agent and that I'm not paying a commission. And I'm not going to reduce the value of my house because I'm not paying a commission. I'm going to pocket that money. My question becomes, to what extent would our insurance companies going forward pocket that commission money as opposed to giving it back to the board? And then when you shift over to a flat rate consultant, it's now a budgetary line item. Which is why we went to the broker to begin with, because we didn't want to spend an additional 
thirty or forty thousand dollars for a consultant when it could be part of the insurance premium. It's part of your premium, and then all the costs are shared with everyone. And I think the whole question comes down to: Do we trust our broker? If we don't, then we should look at going with a consultant arrangement. And when you look at the savings or the, the, the lack of increase that we've seen over the repeated time period, it doesn't look like the guy's looking to maximize his profit. No, and and if if, the, if if commissions are a concern, there are wording in the contracts that we can put uh, that blue, I can specifically tell you Blue Cross Blue Shield does. Blue Shield, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield actually has a, um, in their contract with the brokers that indicate on a yearly basis the broker's commission will not increase by no more than 1% of the prior year's commission. So even if the renewals come in at a 40% oh, like increase, the broker does not get no more than 1% increase on the prior year's commission. So the broker doesn't get his increase on the premium also. What do we have to do to put that? Those are all things that we can do that I can put in place with our broker and send letters to the carriers if that's what the board wishes to do. We reduced this year's, we worked with them, they brought down their numbers 2.8% versus when Brown and Brown was um, in here. They had a higher structure. Doyle being new, they want to keep our business. They're happy servicing the client. They've been a long standing. And I, when I say Doyle, I'm referring to Ryan Tolo, who's been with Doyle, Grinspec, Brown and Brown, who's moved with them. Long standing relationship with the board, and they want to keep it. And, you know, when I went to him and indicated, what we're looking at, they came back with those numbers at the beginning of the year before this all transpired to reduce their uh, rates. So they're on board with us, and they're doing a phenomenal job. Through, and for those who sat on the negotiations committee, uh, knew that there was times I, I, I was able to call Ryan at 9 o'clock at night and he would answer the phone because he knew I was in a negotiation session to answer questions and help us through our process. I'm not sure if you're going to get those types of levels of service. If you go to a flat fee, is someone going to be there at 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock on a negotiation site to answer questions that you have, especially in, in a negotiation session that it can make or break a deal at that point in time. So those are the concerns I have. Um, again, the citizens campaign people are indicate, making it seem like we're not following the rules of the state. Uh, I feel comfortable and and I'll say this any time to the board. I abide by all the rules and regulations that are put upon me by the state. I abide by them. If I have to get my quotes, I get my quotes. If I got a bid, I bid. We do what we have to do to save money for this district. And we do all those things. Uh, and it's nothing against the citizens' campaign. It's just uh, the implication is, is that we don't do things to try and save the district money. And I believe we do. And I think we prove it on a regular basis, the whole administration, in the things we do. I, I would like to proceed in that direction with having the. Uh, I'll have no problem putting those letters. I'll get those letters together, and for the following years, it'll be capped at no greater than this year's level. And I'll just I'll calculate the, the numbers and all that. I do know it's two point eight percent. But if it comes back zero zero, then you have the end. Well, he gets his commission this year based on based what, on the next year. right, and then next year grows off of that. Mr. Macano. Yes. I think what Mrs. Vacco's point is that she's looking, if I'm correct, <coughs> any way of saving the district some extra dollars. Yes. You know, and well, that's what you want to talk about. Am I correct? Correct. You yeah, know, so I, the, I don't think that's a bad idea because if I, know, I didn't get the impression that they were thinking that we were doing something not by the state. I, I didn't get that impression when I went to that seminar. I, I know you said you that, but I didn't. I think they just were looking ways to help district to go through a process to try to save money. I understand that, but when they put forward resolutions and indicators that are already part of the state law, why else would they do that if there's not a belief that you're not doing it? Uh, that, and that's my only concern. Is that the, when you read the resolution, it says the board must see so many bids. One of them must be from the state health benefits. One must be from the New Jersey uh, Joint Insurance Fund. I can't guarantee that those people will put in. So it's it's a misleading resolution to say that these must be addressed. And on top of it, it, it indicates that you must get so many of each. The laws require 
that you follow a process, which we do. And that's why we go out to bid. You, you've done it with your attorneys. You've done it with your um, auditors and all of your professional services <coughs> with uh, special services. So the everything's already in place. All the resolution is does is say, this is what you're supposed to do. And, you know, if the board feels that you need to pass a resolution to feel comfortable that I will abide by the, the rules and regulations of the state, I, I can't stop the board from doing that. But that's all it's going to do is have a resolution that says I will abide by the, the state rules and regulations. The real savings is if you incorporate that language about no greater than one percent. Absolutely. I mean, you could also. I mean, there are so many different ways you can do it. You have control of it. I mean, the industry's out there. You can control what you're doing. And as Kevin said, are there any guarantees that when you come to your premium renewal the following year, that they may not build part of it back into their premium structure? That's always a chance that it can occur. I'm going to tell you, I truly believe they will, because their belief is at some point in time, the board may turn around and say, make a, pay them commissions, and then who's going to make up that delta for that commission? They don't want to hit you with a large increase, so they'll build it up slowly and surely over the years that you're with. Okay. Anything else? Okay. At this time, I'd open up for public. Any uh, thing may come before the board. Anybody from the public have anything to come before the board? Again, please update your name and address for the record. Have a seat. Good morning. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, be, I, got, I, I have to be brief. I promise to be brief. Not You're still looking lovely. Yeah. <laughs> um, I had the pleasure last Wednesday of attending uh, Samson School with um, my fellow seniors um, on the invitation of Bonnie Brady and Mary Desmond and Mr. Andy. They did a wonderful job. Everyone that attended were so impressed with the fourth graders on how bright they were, the questions they asked, and to learn about the community. And they really enjoyed the afternoon, and or the morning rather. And um, Mr. Agalis had taken um, Mrs. Martin and Mrs. Wiesbach and myself and Mr. Setcher on a tour of the school. And I was totally impressed with, I always only saw part of it, you know, when I did attend Samson School, but seeing the whole school and how huge it was, and it was very impressionable. But I think they are to be congratulated. It was a nice thing for the community. Change when record two get broken. Uh, do you know where it'd be hung in the gym? I don't. I, I don't know. I spoke to um, 
Mr. Katan, and he said he's going to put it up, so exactly where it's going, I'm not 100% sure. And but it's not going to be down. I don't think it's going to be low. Okay, and also, there's some records on it from like the early 80s. Is there any way we can have a, some kind of ceremony to honor those people that are still on the record board tonight? Since we've never had a record board before, it's over 30 years now. I don't see why not. Some kind of ceremony, yeah. opening ceremony, something like that. What'd you say the last name was? McKenna. Okay, yeah, so your daughter's name's on your server line. Yes. Well, we're at the swim bank. That was very nice, very nice point. I know I, I read the article in the paper, and the mayor also sent us a, a letter that we received about the concern that, about that pool not being ours and that whole issue about hanging up there. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Anyone else? Sorry to bring this up. I didn't have the meeting minutes in front of me. Um, looking at this uh, this whole thing, um, there was a section in here, section H number two, okay. and it talks about okay. the um, the busing and how we have to pay for those extra two days at the end of the year, it's like seventeen thousand dollars. So, was there not a contract made for one hundred and eighty-two days for busing when we made the contract? No, uh, it was 180. Uh, this year we're going to the 182 days, so we have to extend the contract. Okay, so what, why, why the discrepancy? So when the calendar was made, it was made for 180 days. So we contracted for 180 days? At the beginning, yes. So now we're extending the school year two extra days, and it's costing us seven. dollars We're not extending the school year. It's 182. You look at the existing contract right here. It's 182, 186. Um, Mrs. Shedlock should have, should have prepared for 182 days. It says so, right here. If you look at the if you look at the existing contract, uh, the calendar, it says 182, 186. That's what's approved. So the busing contract was only made for 180 days. So that's why yes, the extra 17. When we went out for the bids, we did 180 days. This year we're going to the 182 days. So we have to give them the so when they do, so for next year, it's going to be correct and there will be the additional. Yes, we're going to have to look at it and make sure we address that problem. Because a, a state regulation is 180 days, so they don't have to go the extra two days? No, but they get educated for two more days, so that's a plan. Well, that's debatable when it's, you know, 90 degrees in the classroom at the end of June. Yeah, you can state your name and address the right. That's the Pinto, 59 Richards Drive, Harlem. Thank you. I understand, you know, yes, it is an extra two days in the classroom. However, it is an extra two days in the heat, extra half days, textbooks taken from many of the students, perhaps not the upper grades. I understand it's that way and it's going to stay that way. But to say it's always been that way, that basically proves it always has not been that way. Because obviously we were not even contracted for months. Anyone else? If not, I'll take a motion for adjournment.